Ho ho ho, chase ghosts come in sleep, watch out, demons are coming, run, sleep, hide spirits, run, ghosts, ghosts, hide, demons, ho ho, ghosts, demons are coming. Hello, my little hellhounds. Welcome to Home of Scares. If you like the chills running down your spine and to be scared, fueled with anxiety, then join us twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And don't forget to increase your anxiety levels. Just make sure you subscribe. Sleep tight, my hellhounds. Lost time in the UK. Posted by Novel Amphibian. I have no idea how we got home. To this day, it defies logic. I have asked the people that were with me. They had not even given it a second thought. Bizarre. I wouldn't consider them to be the type of people to ignore crucial details. But then again, neither am I. And I never even thought to bring it up. Not the next day, not the remainder of our trip, not in the seven years that followed, not until one night at a casual dinner that we had together, some seven years later. They were just as bewildered as I was. Both of them sat in silence for a moment bug-eyed and caught deep in thought. Holy fuck, how did we get home? I asked again. I could feel a slight smile tugging lightly at one corner of my mouth. As I said it, I knew the answer already. I had pondered it for months. I don't know. They both said, in unison. We all sat in silence again, unsure how to continue the conversation. I suppose I should start at the beginning. The listing of the characters and what not, what we were doing, why we were there. Set the scene, I suppose. The couple I was having dinner with our Ben and Stacy, long time good friends of mine. They are good people. Ben and I had shared a mutual interest in JDM drift cars in my early twenties and I had met his partner Stacy not long after he and I had met in 2005 my girlfriend Tegan and I had been invited to go to England to visit my stepfather and I had offered for Ben and Stacy to join us. They eagerly accepted and saved up the money to come along. I have always held a fascination for old, creepy and or abandoned properties or houses and was extremely excited to explore England to see what the country had to offer. Stacy shared my interest in such places and had expressed her interest in accompanying me should I find anything. Ben and Tegan were not as keen on the idea but seemed happy to tag along if anything were to eventuate from this. A few days into our trip, I was able to find that there was an old hospital that had been abandoned since the 1980s 
but it was soon to be repurposed into a mental health clinic. The hospital in question was around a two to three hour drive away into rural English countryside. We rented a car and I spent the best part of an hour explaining to Tegan that if she was going to chicken out on us, it was best that she stay behind. She insisted that she possessed the testicular fortitude to join us and I, perhaps stupidly, believed her. The rental was not cheap as we were all under the age of 25 which meant that the premium remained in the cost for the rental. Regardless, we split the rental cost between all four of us and we asked my stepfather's partner to drop us off to collect the car from the rental hub. We picked up the car, an absolute piece of shit, manual Fiat 500, as it was the cheapest, yet still expensive option. The rear seats had literally 0% padding for Stacy and Tegan who had to sit in the back as I was the driver and Ben towered over all of us. We set off driving and using an outdated road map book that my stepfather had lent us. The Navman option had been out of our price range and let me tell you I will never again complain about New South Wales road posting after trying to navigate around the English countryside. The road map was of minimal help as it was so ancient that three of the turnoffs that were clearly displayed on its yellowed weathered pages no longer even existed. Twice Ben had informed me of an upcoming T intersection that never arrived and yet we seemed to seamlessly enter into the route that we had planned out regardless. We stopped at KFC which was a massive culture shock to all of us. No potato and gravy, baked beans instead. Thank God our ancestors had committed crimes that had sent them to Australia back in the day. Tegan and Stacy were mumbling about the lack of padding on the back seat, which Ben and I brushed off as unnecessary whining. We finished up lunch and set off on the road again. The days are short in England. The sunlight disappears much quicker than back home. I was not particularly bothered as I just thought that it would simply add to the dark atmosphere when we eventually arrive. We arrived in the general vicinity of the hospital after about two hours of driving and said to hell with the road map as it was more trouble than it was worth. We saw some old signposts on bent poles that indicate that we were heading in the right direction and decided to follow them. It took us through a rabbit warren of back roads and dirt tracks, doing U-turns and a lot of swearing until we came across the ruins of a castle-esque type house that had obviously been gutted out from a fire some years ago. I decided to stop here to stretch our legs and get some photos. The ruins of this place were amazing. I managed to get some great pictures. Although I was only starting out as a photographer and so they are grainy at best. We loitered around for about 45 minutes before deciding to give the hospital one more crack. We piled into the car and white knuckled the reading of the road map 
Ben and I had decided on a likely route before I started the car and we set off. We actually managed to find the hospital this time. Ben had chosen the route well and I rolled up to a toll booth that was located on the road just outside the hospital grounds. I could see the building in the distance and the plant equipment sectioned off nearby in order to begin demolition or renovations. The security guard at the toll booth did not seem too pleased to see us and was very dismissive. I imagine he turns people away all the time for the very same reason that we were trying to gain entry. I was determined not to give up though. After I did a three point turn to get out of the small section of road, I rounded the corner in order to circumvent the, the patrolled area and entered an estate at the rear entrance of the hospital. Parking the car, I could see that the hospital lay just beyond an open field nearby. The sky was pitch black by now. The only lighting was coming from dimly lit street lamps that flickered on and off every few seconds. When I opened the door, I noticed that the air was incredibly cold and the street was eerily silent. Stacy and I practically leapt out of the car in anticipation of getting to the hospital while Ben and Tegan reluctantly opened their respective doors to get out. We all zipped up our jackets and put our scarves on while trudging into the field. The ground was so wet and muddy that we had to use torches on our phones to prevent ourselves from sinking our feet in foot deep puddles. Clearly this field had been recently used to move the plant equipment to the area and as a result much of the terrain was torn up with deep turrets from machine tracks. Stacy and I took the lead while Ben and Tegan lagged behind. I did not think too much of it. I knew that they were not into this stuff. We walked for about two minutes before I heard before I heard Ben call out to us. Stacy and I stopped and turned around. What? I said as I stood still. A light breeze beginning to blow now. Tegan doesn't want to go. Ben said, apologetic tone. I looked at Tegan. Her head was bowed down toward the ground and her arms were crossed tightly over her chest. We all stood for a moment and I sighed loudly. Okay, let's go back to the car. Stacy and I were not happy, but we knew that leaving Tegan at the car was not an option and we wanted everybody to come with us. Stacy let out an audible, damn it, as we began painstaking journey back to the little Fiat. When we got back to the car, we all silently got in and took a moment to make our clothing a little more comfortable for travel. This is where the story gets a little strange. Not much was said between any of us. I started the car and began to drive. We did not discuss a route home and I had no clue where we were. I just started driving. I found a dirt road and took that. Nobody in the car said a word about this. I noticed a sign haphazardly nailed crookedly to a gnarly looking tree that said London 40 miles that somebody had obviously painted and made at home. I continued to drive. I remember nothing about that road. I don't recall anything until I was at a large intersection back in London. I looked around the car. All of us wore stoic expressions 
and seemed rather listless. Then another skip, like a damaged VHS tape. We were at a Chinese restaurant near to where my stepfather lived. We were all sitting around a square table with a cheap blue tablecloth. All of a sudden, all four of our forks slid off the table and onto the floor. Stacy and I were opposite each other when this had happened and we glanced at each other with perplexed expressions before bending down to retrieve our forks. Stacy looked at me again and said, That was weird. She sounded far off and distant and as though she was talking underwater. What? I asked, straining my ears to hear her, just as her volume and cadence returned back to normal. That was weird, she said, clear as day. The bustling noises of a busy restaurant also, now returning to fill the void of ambient background noise that I had not even noticed was missing up until that point. Skip again, getting into bed and feeling extremely heavy and sedated. We all woke up the next day and seemed perfectly normal. We ate breakfast together while Ben and I cracked bad jokes off each other as we always did. We returned the car later that day after I checked the back seats, after the fuss the girls had made, and yes, they were indeed devoid of any padding, and never spoke of the outing again, not once. Losing hours of time with friends that can verify that they experienced the same thing, a subconscious refusal to dwell on it, or even bring it up what the fuck actually happened that night let childhood memories remain just Childhood Memories Posted by MTP6921 Every summer, as a kid, I would go to upstate New York with my parents to stay at an old country house that was passed down to my aunt from her relatives. All of my mother's side of the family would stay there for a week. I was the youngest and the next youngest cousin was five years older than me. The private road to the house was about a mile long which was shared with a neighbour who lived a quarter mile past my aunt's house. Fortunately for me, the neighbour had a boy who was the same age as me. So when I would visit my aunt's house, I would go and knock on his door. His name was Kyle, and we would do boy things like play in the creek and roam through the woods. This would happen every year until the summer of 1989, when something unexpected happened. Unfortunately, my aunt's house was close to an underground coal mine where the coal was slowly burning underground, which made the house uninhabitable to stay in. So the house was torn down. I was feeling nostalgic in the summer of 2002, so I took my wife Gina and my two-year-old daughter Grace to see my aunt's property in upstate New York. It was a two hour drive from Queens, New York. As I pulled into the driveway to my aunt's property, I had such a warm feeling 
of happy childhood memories. I parked the car where the house used to be. My daughter got out and ran around the private road. Then we walked to the neighbour Kyle's house, who I hadn't seen since 1989. I felt awkward knocking on the door, so we just stood in front of the house. Then, something really bizarre happened. A boy that looked exactly like Kyle in 1989, who was 12 years old, came out of the house. I said, hi, my name is Jim. I used to come here as a boy before the house next door was torn down. Are your parents home? The boy responded, my parents aren't home right now. I said, by the way, is your dad's name Kyle? The boy responded, no, my name is Kyle. I said, do you remember a boy named Jim who used to come here during the summertime? Kyle responded, yeah, Jim was here about two months ago. I then said, Kyle, my name is Jim and I haven't been here since 1989. Then Kyle laughed and said, you've grown a lot in two months. Then I said to Kyle, Kyle, what year is it? Kyle responds, 1989. My wife Gina said, Jim, this kid must be confused. I then said to my wife Gina, please go to the car with Grace as I figure out what's going on. Gina and Grace walked to the car as I tried to figure out the story behind Kyle. I said, if you're Kyle, take me to the place where we used to go. As soon as I started walking with Kyle, I felt like I was 12 years old again. Within two minutes, I stopped seeing myself as a 25-year-old man, and I felt like I was a 12-year-old kid again. Kyle led me to the creek where we skipped stones and navigated over rocks in the creek. Then we played pretend soldiers in the woods. This was a nice break from my boring engineering job. I didn't want these moments to end. I looked at my watch and it was three hours later. I said to Kyle, I'll be right back. I have to go and check on Gina and Grace. He said, okay. As I walked back toward my aunt's property, something odd starts to happen. I actually see my aunt's house that was torn down years ago. But with every step I take, the house starts to fade away and my car becomes more apparent. I stop walking and I think to myself, if I walk too close to my aunt's property, will Kyle disappear forever? I walk a few steps closer to the car and the house becomes really dim to the point where I could barely make out the house. I start to faintly notice my wife sitting in the passenger seat and Grace standing in the back seat. I think really hard knowing that I will return to reality with the next few steps and Kyle might disappear forever. I decided to cross the threshold where the house completely disappears. I see my wife looking through the rear view mirror and then she gets out of the car and says, what took you so long? I responded, oh, Oh, I was just checking out the area I used to go and play as a kid. Gina then says, did you figure out who the boy was? I brush it off and lied to my wife and said, oh, he was just a son 
of the boy I grew up with. My wife looked perplexed, but didn't ask me any other questions regarding Kyle. The whole car ride home, I was on cloud nine. I felt like I had the opportunity to reconnect with a part of my childhood that was abruptly taken away from me. I felt like a rejuvenated person when I went back to work. I didn't want the feeling to end, so I went by myself the following Sunday again to see Kyle. About two hours later, I pulled onto my aunt's private road. I parked where my aunt's house used to be before it was torn down. Then I walked to Kyle's house and I was elated to see that he was still there. I went every Sunday up until the winter time where the snow made it too difficult to travel. I could hardly wait until springtime to see Kyle again. It's now springtime and my wife told me that if I wanted to go upstate then I had to take our daughter Grace with me. I agreed and I took Grace with me every Sunday except winter time for the next six years. It was great because Grace got to experience my childhood firsthand. The only thing was that when Grace got older, Kyle and Grace didn't want to include me anymore. Eventually it got to the point where I would just sit in the car while the two of them played by the creek. It was getting late one Sunday and Grace had not returned to the car so I went back to the creek to go get her. Grace was holding her head and I said, Honey, what happened? Grace replied, I don't know. I must have fallen or hit my head somehow. Kyle said he didn't know what happened. Grace and I walked towards the car and Kyle walked home. As I walked closer to my car, I saw my aunt's house start to fade away. I turn towards my daughter and I say, oh my God, as Grace starts to get translucent, I start to cry and I tell Grace to stop walking and turn around. Grace says, why daddy? I reply, because you might disappear forever. My daughter was no longer translucent and she got further away from my car. I went back to my car and called my wife to come to my aunt's property as soon as possible. Gina arrived two hours later and was crying hysterically when I explained to her the situation with Grace. Gina runs towards Kyle's house and hugs Grace. Gina said, I can't live without Grace. I told my wife, there's a rope in the back of my car. If we both want to have an accident by the creek, then we can stay here forever with Grace. My wife, crying hysterically, agrees. I tell my wife to wait with Grace as I walk into the woods out of sight from the two of them. Then I tie the rope around a tree branch I returned to my wife and Grace after my accident. I noticed that I started getting translucent as I get closer to my car and my head starts to get foggy. So I turn around and the fogginess goes away. Now Gina takes the rope and walks to the creek. The three of us hug each other before Gina takes the walk. Then my wife returns. The three of us walk towards my aunt's house. And this time we see there are no cars and the house remains where we decided to live together.
the hump posted by e block hello everyone this is my first time posting ever but i wanted to share my story the few people that i have told have called me crazy i don't know maybe i am maybe this was a dream but if it was it was the realest dream I ever had. I grew up in a house that had been passed down through the generations since it had been built. I was about 11 or 12 years old and knew nothing of the paranormal or even aliens. My cousin who was living with us at the time had just moved out and left me their bed. Their bed was a queen size, so I figure jackpot. I just upgraded my bed and my room, cause I surely wasn't moving that bed, and my parents surely didn't have time. Now I had been in the room for a couple of months, and everything was great until this particular night. Nothing out of the ordinary happened that day, it was business as usual, did my homework, ate dinner, shower, bed. As I lie there sleeping, I suddenly wake up and notice I'm on my back. I'm a side sleeper, I never sleep on my back. I sit up on my elbows to look at the time and that's when I notice it, this big what I can only describe as a hump in the middle of my mattress down by the foot of the bed as if someone was standing under my bed well I know that can't be possible the height of the bed and the box springs would make that impossible now I don't need to tell you that at this point I'm shitting myself Finally, I get the balls to say something. I don't remember what I said, because in the middle of what I was saying, my bed rose up a little more, and whatever it was, ran down the middle of my bed so fast. I didn't have time to react. I jumped out of bed so fast and flicked the light on and started looking under the bed only to find nothing there. How? I know for a hundred percent fact I felt a solid head or something pass under my ass and up my back. Needless to say I didn't go back to sleep nor did I turn the lights out. Remember I said the house had been in my family since in its construction well, about 15 years ago, my father sold the house to non-family. Six months after he moved out, the house burned down and the fire originated in his old bedroom. Coincidence. I've only told a couple other people this story and they called me crazy. So that's why... I don't tell this story. I have other stories, but those are for another day. Everything in this story is real and happened to me. I hope you all enjoyed what I call my first paranormal experience. Nightmare Shadow posted by Lost Boy 70 This took place in Southern California in late 2007 to early 2008 
my first real job outside of high school, drywall construction. I was 20 and had just turned 21 when this happened. I'm now 34. I was learning a new skill as a drywaller in new home construction. Me and my supervisor, the guy teaching me, let's call him Big Owl, working the weekend on a Saturday morning, we were the only ones on this side of the property. There was maybe 10 people on this property. No one else was in the houses. The other people were on the far end of the land clearing out the trees and land for more homes. So here is where the story begins. Me and my supervisor, Big Al, were fixing up a wall in the JR bathroom. He left the house to take a call from the office. My truck, as I started preparing the wall, it was just inside the doorway. It was warm, but not hot outside. I was doing my work about five minutes. Doing work, it felt like someone blew on my cheek, which I thought was my boss because he was a big joker. I popped my head out to see if it was him. And it wasn't, so I moved down the hall and it happened again. So I put down my tools and looked all upstairs looking for him and looked out of the window and saw him on my tailgate talking on the phone. So I walked to the bathroom to finish up and saw past the doorway in the master bedroom was a freestanding shadow looking straight at me. It wasn't laying on the floor or the wall as I went to the bathroom, picked up my tools and ran out of the room downstairs, almost knocking over my supervisor and threw the tools I had in the bed of the truck and got in the driver's seat. As he came out, he said, Let's get the flying fuck out of here. We got about 20 minutes down the street to a bar and he said, I saw the thing in the master bedroom. And about 45 minutes later, out big boss man calls us, saying that we weren't there and get the fuck back there. But Big Al said in his southern way of talking, Hell no, and to do something that's impossible for a guy to do to himself. About two weeks later, I quit because our boss wanted us to go back to that place again. I went to go back to his office to pick up my last check. Real life mirrors a dream posted by Lost Boy 70. I never told this story before outside close friends and family, so here it goes. Please be patient because it's kind of long. This is a little pretext. This happened to me six months before 
we were talking about this trip, I had a dream where I felt cold and there was something hitting my ankle and calf area and I could smell blood mingled with pine. Then for about two weeks to the day later, my stepfather and I were carpooling to work and school and he said if anything ever happens you and your mother will be taken care of this happened to me and my mom and stepfather of 19 years the winter break of 2005 they had a tradition of going to Europe every winter different countries this year was my first time in Europe we were in the Czech Republic beautiful country for Christmas we decided we would go to Poland to see Auschwitz death camp and on our way back to our hotel after a long day of, of doing the tour of the camp we decided to go back to the hotel in Czech Republic on our way back our driver fell asleep behind the wheel totally destroying his van which flung out my parents which later killed my stepfather due to his massive damage to his torso heart lungs my mum spent four months in and later died in the States. Mum's injuries was less serious with a broken arm, leg and minor concussion. She spent about three weeks in hospital and came home. Unfortunately, my stepfather never made it out of the hospital in Los Angeles. New Zealand Horror posted by Novel Amphibian I was approximately four to five years of age and living in with my mum and younger brother Seamus in a small three bedroom house in Otago, New Zealand. The house was small and run down, thin insulation and made of cheap weatherboard. As the older and somewhat more hyperactive brother, I did not conform to normal sleeping patterns and would quite often wake up at all hours of the night, including the very early morning. Of course, I decided that I would need to include my brother Seamus in any shenanigans that I could get up to. But this night was different. Instead of including Seamus in activities, I in fact excluded him in the worst possible way. It was a typically cold South Island night and there was already frost etched on every glass surface on the outside of the house. New Zealand often gets into the minus degrees and this night was no exception. I awoke as usual past midnight and immediately crawled out of my bed and opened the bedroom door. Seamus's room was directly across from mine and I made my way into his room easily as he slept with the door open. Seamus, I whispered. Seamus, I called a little louder this time, reaching out to rock his shoulder gently. Seamus grunted quietly before slowly rolling over to look at me. What 
he asked sleepily, yawning as he did so, while rubbing his eyes lazily. Wanna go on an adventure, I said. I'll never forget how quickly his eyes lit up. Yeah, he practically jumped out of bed. We snuck down the hall, past our mother's room, and turned right into the kitchen, where we continued through to the back door. You first, I said, as I opened the door for Seamus. Seamus stepped out without hesitation. I then slammed the door shut, locking it, covering my mouth to stifle the fit of laughter that was attempting to escape from my throat. The door had no glass that I was able to peer out of as I was under four feet tall. If I tilted my head upward, I could see a small rectangular pane of grimy, unwashed glass, though. It was out of reach to me, however, and so I chose to ignore it. I stood there, hand flat against the hardwood, waiting for Seamus to begin pounding on the door at any second. This was a prank that I played on him fairly regularly, and he always reacted this in the same manner, which was sheer no-holds-barred panic. But, no sound, nothing. I waited and waited, still nothing. No knocks, no cries. I carefully retrieved a chair from the dining room table and rammed it hard up against the door before scrambling up onto it in order to peer through the glass pane. I could see nothing except for our backyard. I got down off the chair and moved it out of the way before turning the large bronze knob of the deadbolt mechanism. I gingerly unlocked the door and opened it slowly to prevent the hinges from squealing too loudly and peered outside. Nothing, just darkness and chilled wind. Panicky, I shut the door and opened it again, hoping that would help but it did not achieve anything. I closed the door, confused. I thought that he had perhaps caught onto my trick and had ran to the front door of the house. I made my way swiftly there, unlocking it and throwing it open. Once again, just a dark void. My imagination was running wild and I thought that I could hear the faint cry of my name being repeated on the light breeze. As a five-year-old, I didn't, didn't have any grasp on the seriousness of the situation. I did not want to wake my mum up at this time of night to explain what... My mum was up at this time of night to explain to what happened to her so I went to bed Seamus was back in his bed in the morning and nothing was said he seemed a little odd though my mum even picked up on it he was back to his usual self after a few days however and now our lives returned to normal I never pranked him in such a manner ever again. Years later, while we were sharing a bottle of whiskey, I brought the situation up with Seamus and in inquired as to what had happened to him that night. His face suddenly became stern and pale. I was hoping you had forgotten all about that, he said under his breath. He took another swig of whiskey and sighed before delving into his side of what happened that night. Seamus to this day has fleeting images 
of the door shutting, opening rapidly for about two minutes, with nobody being the cause. He remembers screaming and shouting for help and banging on every house surface and window for a full 15 minutes, always feeling like he was being watched, catching glimpses of a tall dark figure standing near him. The cold was dreadful and had seemed to literally seep into his bones. The silence for him was only ever broken by a sharp wheeze of breath or snarl that seemed to be right next to his ear. I then asked him, how did you get back inside? He looked at me and said, I fell from the ceiling of our house into our lounge room. It was like a nightmare. Something is wrong with my dog, posted by Concept Just. Click. I turned on the TV and walked into the kitchen. The microwave started beeping, meaning my bag of popcorn was done cooking. I took it out, grabbed the butter from the counter and poured it on. The butter sizzled down through the kernels to the bottom of the bag. I went over to the couch and sat down. The TV was turned to a breaking news report. Hundreds of dogs from all around Ikea, New Mexico seemed to have suddenly gone missing. The Nevada Department of Conservation and natural resources says that they are looking into why these disappearances are occurring. More on this at 12, said the newscaster. I threw my bowl of uneaten popcorn in the trash and decided to go to bed. It was getting pretty late and I had a meeting early in the morning. I went upstairs and into my room. My dog Laker, a large golden retriever, was laying on the ground. She looked up at me with sad, doggy eyes before dropping her head back down onto the carpet. Hey buddy, I said, what's the matter? Of course, my dog just lay there aimlessly staring at the wall. I shrugged and went into the bathroom to get ready for bed. I hopped in a quick shower, brushed my teeth and climbed into bed. Staring up at the ceiling, I emptied my mind and drifted off to sleep. Boom, boom, boom. The loud pounding on the door jolted me awake. I shot upright and looked over at the clock, 3.33 a.m. God damn it, I muttered as I pulled the covers off me. I looked over at the floor where Laker was laying, only to see it was now vacant. I sighed and walked out the open door into the hallway. It was dark, and not because there were no lights on. Something felt off, the air felt thicker, no, heavier than normal. I rounded the corner to the stairs when I was abruptly hit with this awful smell. It smelt like rotten meat. I pulled my shirt up over my face and covered my nose, but I could still smell it. 
I walked down the stairs and looked around for Laker, but she was nowhere to be seen. Confused, I walked over to open the large front door. Just as I was about to open it, something stopped me. I felt a chill run from the back of my neck all the way down my spine. I shuddered and opened the door. There was nobody there. I looked around my empty yard. Then I stepped out and scanned the tree line in the back of the yard. There was nothing out there. Slowly I closed the front door and stepped back inside. As I turned around I was surprised to see Laker suddenly standing at the door. I leaned down to pet her but stopped. There was something off about her. I couldn't tell what it was at first but then I started to notice her ears were standing straight up which she never does. Drool and slobber poured from her open mouth which revealed her jagged pointed teeth which appeared sharper than normal. I looked at her eyes. Something wasn't right about them. They looked dark and empty but most noticeably they looked human. She began to bark and I stepped back, tripping. I fell onto the ground and scurried backwards. Her bark echoed through the house. It sounded off, almost as if it was her bark, but at the same time there was a deeper sound to it as well. Something not natural, something demonic. Suddenly her head snapped, sharply left, and she looked at me. She looked right at me, with those black, lifeless eyes. Then, just as soon as she appeared, Laker was gone. She stood up, looked at the door, then back at me, before wandering down the hall towards the kitchen. Terrified, I ran upstairs and closed the door. I walked past Laker, now lying on the floor of my room, and got back into bed to go to sleep. It wasn't until I had just started to drift off to sleep when I realised I had seen Laker go down the hall not into my room. Whatever I had seen downstairs was not my dog. It was something else entirely. Flash forward six months. One of my clients, a Dr. Ashkey Dignin, who was a Native American man from the local Navajo tribe, came into my work one Monday afternoon before we had started talking business. I had him introduce himself to me and tell me a few stories about himself. One of the stories he told caught my attention. He told a story about an encounter he had with a tribal creature known as a skinwalker. He said that these creatures, skinwalkers, were evil creatures summoned by Navajo witches that had the ability to transform into any animal they pleased. He also described he also described the awful wretched odour that they give off. I was shocked, now positive that I had an encounter with a skinwalker that one fateful night. 
I jumped back from my desk, running to the bathroom. I had no clue what to do. Until this point, I had been told my whole life that monsters aren't real. Now I know that's not true. Monsters are real. All you have to do is know where to look. Thanks for listening, my little hellhounds, and remember to click the like button and subscribe to hear more stories like these. And don't forget, if you have any stories, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at home of scares now good night my little hellhounds <laughs>